very much for coming to the panel. I think we're going to have a, a, a really fascinating debate uh, and, uh, about what probably one of the, the longest discussed topics in foreign investment and economic development, which is incentives. You know, uh, and how you can use incentives most effectively, are they needed, the impact on competitiveness in particular, which is the focus of um, AIM this year. Um, I'm really delighted to have a you know, really extinguished panel um, of leading experts from private sector, government, and inter international organizations. So we're going to have a really, I think, interesting and lively debate. Um, first of all, just to say who I am, uh, my name is Henry Lovendahl. I'm CEO of Wabtech and also Senior Vice President of Middle East for FDI Intelligence. Um, work with companies and governments helping them attract investment. I'm going to give a, a very, very quick um, introduction to each of the panelists, and then we're going to kick off with, uh, with, with questions for each one. So just to introduce uh, the panelists going in order, so I'd like to welcome first of all Dr. Douglas Vandenberger, President and CEO of Investment Consulting Associates. Um, sitting next to Douglas is Prof Professor Kenneth Thomas, um, Professor of Political Science at the University of Missouri. Um, sitting next to Professor Kenneth is um, Alberto Aliman, Director of ProInvex Panama. Sitting next to Alberto is Minister Jerry Naumov, um, Minister of Foreign, um, trying to read my writing here. <laughs> Investments. <laughs> Thank you. Foreign Investment. I should know Foreign Investment. Um, from Mas from, um, from uh, Ma uh, Mas Macedonia. Then is Dr. Adib Al-Afifi. Director of Foreign Trade and Export Support of the Abu Dhabi Department of Economic Development. Um, sitting next to Dr. Adib is Dr. Himawen um, Hari Yoga, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, Deputy Chairman of Investment Promotion from BKPM Indonesia. And, and last but not least, uh, Mr. Hamid Mamadou, um, Director of Trade and Services from the World Trade Organization. So I think from those in introductions you can see we have a, you know, a fantastic panel. So just to get the um, debate kicked off, um, um, Douglas, you're um, CEO of one of the leading site selection consulting firms. It'd be really good to hear from the uh, investor perspective when you're working with companies. I mean, how really important are incentives in site selection decisions? Do they actually make a difference in terms of which country is selected, or are they just icing on the cake for the investor? Thank you, Henry. That's actually a very good question. and and one that I can obviously not answer in one sentence, but um, I, I pulled out some statistics actually from, um, from your database, Incentives Monitor, and, and the average incentive award that has been given in terms of uh, the amount that in, uh, investors receive is about, uh, if you look at it per job, is about $40,000 per job, which is quite an amount. So obviously if you take the global average of 40,000 jobs that governments pay, in order to um, have investments that create one job. That's an enormous amount of money. Secondly, um, um, that amount is, has increased, I think, slightly over the last couple of years. So obviously the return of investment for governments must be much higher. Um, then obviously the next question is, and this has been part of a long political debate, not only in, in developing countries, but also in developed markets, like for instance in the United States, um, are we not wasting taxpayers' money? These are some quotes from the, the national press or the international press, or is it, is it not corporate welfare that we are giving? Well, we see changes, and this is what I can only see about in terms of the corporate work that we do. We see changes in terms of what companies would like to see when they um, invest abroad and are negotiating incentives or even asking for incentives with governments. First of all, we notice that many of the investment agencies actually present incentives when they are not even on the table yet when in negotiating investment projects. So it's sometimes the governments themselves that offer them. I think a very good example was Google in the UK that actually was on their um, increased, um, uh, had increased intention from the international press uh, that it received so much tax grants from the UK government, but the, the answer from the CFO was actually that it was not Google that asked for it, but it was offered by the UK government. So obviously that's you know one tendency we see. But we see also see a lot of changes. Companies are looking for more durability and sustainability and stability investment projects, which means that you know they're taking a more long-term perspective. And this is only very relevant, very new. Um, they look at FDI from a more long-term perspective. 
cost cutting is not only the thing that, that has been something in the past, but today they look at it very differently. Um, so this is also what they like to achieve with the types of incentives they receive. Uh, for instance, uh, some of the companies are actually asking for incentives in terms of sustainability. Uh, so they would also like to see more sustainability criteria in the incentive programs, which makes sense. You know, there's a changing um, a transition phase. We're in a transition phase towards more durable, stable investment and incentive policies. And corporate po policies or corporate investments are also more long-term in terms of their perspective. Um, finally, just to, to close off, it's what we also hear from many corporates that not the right incentive packages are offered. Uh, there is a discrepancy between what they would like to achieve or what they would like to realize in an investment location in terms of finding the right skills and training and the types of incentive packages that are offered. For instance, a good example is always corporate income tax exemptions. They are only relevant if the company is going to make profit. So if you provide them for a call center or shared service center activities, they do not make sense because these are cost centers. Companies will not be making any profits on those operations. So for them, it makes much more sense to come up with sensible or smart incentives in order to train people. Uh, so provide deductions in terms of the training costs that companies make. So these are just some, some kick of um, quotes that you know, we've seen over the past couple of years. Thank you. Thanks, Douglas. I mean, just one you know, quick uh, question on the back of that. Um, when you're advising companies on their site selection, are incentives in the initial kind of screening criteria to decide where to go, or do they come after they've already decided on the, the country or whatever it is they're going to invest? I mean, at w what stage does it come in the decision making? It's, it's in only in very rare cases it's the key driver of investment decisions. Key drivers today are having skilled people, talented people, um, what's the stability of the investment arrangements, political stability is increasingly one of the items that comes up. Uh, remarkably, cost has also moved much more. It was Usually investment projects were driven by cost, cost savings, or whether the location was cost competitive. That has also moved in general to a much lower uh, priority for many companies. So incentives are usually the tip of the iceberg, as many often say, or the dessert, the cherry on top, if you may say. But they're not the key driver. And, and I think many governments must, must realize that if companies ask for incentives straight away, you may wonder if that's the type of investment project that you would be running after. I mean, thank you very much for those excellent comments. Um, Professor Kenneth Thomas, you know, you're one of the leading researchers in the area of incentives. I know we've, we've had a communication over the years about incentives and data, so it's really a pleasure to have you here, um, especially with your um, research also looking at the, of the US, and the US you know, gives the most incentives in the world, so always interesting to see what they're doing. Um, but what does your research over the years show? Um, how can governments use incentives more successfully for levers? Um, of location competitiveness, and also asking the same question I asked the Douglas is, you know, do they actually make a difference to, to, to uh, location decisions? Right, um, thank you for having me here. I'm uh, happy to talk about my, my own experience. I'd like to uh, say, you know, I think, uh, as, as you all know anyway, I think incentives should be used sort of sparingly uh, with a, re a view to reducing them whenever possible. I, you know, it, when they come in, at the end of the uh, negotiation process, it, uh, perhaps with several different uh, uh, potential locations, they still wind up playing a very significant difference in making making the choices. Um, but as a, overall, you know, the incentives have a, a high opportunity cost in terms of money that could have gone to uh, infrastructure, education, training, and healthcare. And I think that countries in the beginnings of their development really need to focus on that. You know, some of what we saw at the last panel suggested, you know, you do need to have some sequencing that you do need to achieve things in education prior to really being able to effectively attract foreign direct investment. And uh, I think, you know, even a country like Ireland shows that. Ireland was giving incentives, you know, from the late 50s into the 80s and was not growing any faster than the rest of the European Union mm -hmm. uh, with those policies. It really wasn't until you know, their education reforms took off, until they had a social partnership, that they were able to turn into the Celtic tiger. Um, the second thing I want to emphasize is that you know, once you are in a position where you can you know, benefit from using incentives, your choice of your investment partner is extremely important. 
know, there's always uh, an inherent imbalance or asymmetry in information between the uh, investor and the government. And uh, so, you, you know, you really want to avoid uh, ploys that you sometimes see where you speak to only the site location consultant and don't even know who the uh, investor is. Um, and then once you do know the identity of the investor, you want to uh, make sure you check its track record on labor relations, environmental behavior, um, how it re often it resorts to dispute settlement, um, whether it runs away as soon as, as uh, its incentives expire, that sort of thing. So firms that perform well in all of these are the firms that you should be trying to attract. Uh, third, you're going to contribute the most to your uh, competitiveness and long-term development by being able to monitor and enforce the agreements you do make. You know, in the United States, we see uh, cases where states that have uh, perfect legal authority to have clawback provisions have, you know, given them up in specific contract negotiations. The cases of the case of Tennessee with uh, Electrolux and with uh, Wacker Chemi come to mind in that regard. Um, fourth, I can't you know, stress more that uh, it's really important to have uh, an ex post evaluation of you know, all your individual projects, but also the entire portfolio of programs. And so you know, I know that governments uh, are, are doing this, but you know, it varies uh, strikingly among governments. And finally, you know, kind of related to what I said about uh, the evaluation and investor choice is that you know, there's been a trend recently that in international investment agreements there's been a recognition that you know it's not only governments that have responsibilities you know firms have responsibilities too and um, so there's being more of an acknowledgement that there needs to be room room for policy changes over you know a long period of time that there's many recipes for development, as Danny Roderick says, and um, you know I think this is a good development overall that we're we're seeing this kind of a trend. I mean, uh, thank you very much. There's uh, no, some really insightful comments there. I think you know the comment which stood out most to me is um, you know incentives on their own don't achieve economic competitiveness. Is that is that what you're saying? I mean, if, if you just use incentives as, as the policy to attract investment and hope that leads to competitiveness, it's not going to happen. That's right. Yeah. There's got to be other policies, you know, like I said, education, yeah. infrastructure, yeah. training, et cetera, that are all necessary before yeah. you know, incentives are really going to make a great difference as far as true competitiveness yeah. goes. And I think your comments about you know, incentives evaluation, I mean, I think there's not that many probably governments which actually evaluate their whole programs, the individual projects, the incentives they're given, and actually have they delivered the economic development in, uh, benefits which they, they hope they would, be, they would give. And uh, were they really needed to attract that investment in the first place? So I think that's really interesting. And just finally, I mean, Douglas, you mentioned <coughs> about sustainable development, that companies are more looking towards you know, locations which maybe will incentivize more sustainable activities as companies mo move in that area. And then um, uh, Professor Kenneth, you also mentioned that at the same time, government should be looking for companies which are going to contribute to sustainable development, not just jobs and investment. It's much wider than that. Right. You have looking at you know, the social policies, the environmental policies, and everything else about that company. And I think, that's, I think those two comments you know, are, are really, really interesting and valuable for maybe the future direction which incentives policy should go. So, I mean, um, moving to um, the case of Panama. So, um, Alberto, um, as director of Proin uh, Invex Panama, um, and your experience of working with investors, bringing them to Panama, um, and I know that Panama does have quite extensive incentives, especially uh, free zones. I mean, Panama Pacifico is very well known as a location for foreign investors, tracks a lot of FDI. Um, also, taking into account the previous comments on incentives, I mean, looking at your incentives policy in Panama, um, first of all, has it made any difference to attracting FDI? Did it allow you to attract more FDI than you would have without incentives? Um, and do you think there's any way your incentives policy could be changed over time or, or policies you're planning to kind of link it more to you know, improving competitiveness, not just about getting foreign companies to invest? So I know challenging questions, uh, so uh, no, we uh, look forward to your answer. <laughs> no, uh, thank you, Henry, and uh, it's, it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, the short answer to all your questions is yes. Uh, 
Since 2010, Panama has been able to attract uh, over 300 uh, greenfield uh, projects. That's not counting retail or mergers and acquisitions. Um, between 2014 and 2015, FDI grew by 17%. And between 2015 and 2016, it also grew again by, 20, by 17 percent. So currently, uh, FDI is essentially the the, the field that that, uh, that um, it, it propels our, our our growth. And Panama is growing at a at a rate of about six percent up until 2021. At least those are the the the, the medium term projections. Mm -hmm. So FDI is is absolutely important. In, in fact, uh, um, it's, it's a crucial matter of sustainable development for the country. Now, uh, uh, there's, there's an additional point to stress how important FDI is for, for, for Panama. Um, it is currently 11% of GDP. Wow. Um, so that's, that's, the bro that's the largest stake or stock of FDI in any Latin American country. Now, that is the reason why Panama um, it offers very attractive uh, incentives, but the incentives, more than needing to be attractive, they need to be uh, relevant. So, you know, there's special economic areas like Panama Pacifico that have attracted over, over 290 a, a, a companies in, in a broad range of, of incentivized activities. Some of them Fortune 500 and, and, and Forbes Global 2000 firms. Uh, there's another uh, uh, incentives regime that is not necessarily tied to an area, which is fairly unique in the region. I don't know how unique it is in the world, but it, it's, it's a multinational headquarters regime, which uh, it, 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 it creates a package for firms to uh, deploy um, shirt service delivery centers mm -hmm. to operate from Panama uh, to the region. Now, that particular uh, uh, incentives regime is is an interesting case study because um, it's it's not your traditional uh, free trade zone. Though Panama is very competitive in the in the free trade zone uh, uh, a, a, a framework. In fact, we have the second largest free trade zone in the world. But that particular regime has been able to attract in only 10 years about 130 multinational firms that have grown exponentially since their original investment. As a matter of fact, about 57% of FDI current FDI in Panama is reinvestment. So a lot of these companies uh, test the waters, see that they can grow. They will start with, a, for example, a financial share services activity, and then they'll diversify into managing HR or marketing or you name it. Now, what I mean about relevant incentives is that you can offer fiscal incentives and companies will sometimes take those for granted because every company, uh, every country that you're competing to attract a limited amount of FDI inflows into a particular region will offer similar packages. Uh, they need to be, um, uh, they need to go beyond a, 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 a simple fiscal incentive. They need to go beyond a simple uh, fiscal sacrifice. They need to uh, 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 essentially generate wealth, uh, generate economic activity, promote competition, uh, and integrate the, the, the local uh, 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 ecosystem of suppliers of goods and services to those very sophisticated um, foreign direct investment projects th th that you bring into your country. So Panama, in the case of Panama, you need to tie those fiscal incentives to migration incentives. So for example, that multinational headquarters regime is, is, is oriented to attracting shared services activities. Now, these aren't call centers. We're not competitive in, in, in very basic back office activities. We are at a, at a higher level of sophistication. So when you tie that to the right kind of immigration policy, then you allow these companies to, to, to have a soft landing and to attract the right kind of talent so they, they can quickly deploy and the, the, the the, the, challenge, the challenges that they would otherwise face in, in, in their time to competence is drastically reduced. While at the same time, it's beneficial for the country because it, it, uh, by attracting the right kind of talent, you create a virtuous cycle of, of uh, transfer of, of, of knowledge that is very, very important. Now, I completely agree with, with, with the previous panelists that incentives are not always the, the key driver. So, you know, when you look at your country uh, and, and you understand its unique value proposition, 
um, you realize that, that a, a key part, a fundamental part, is making sure that, uh, that, that the country has the right conditions for the type of activities that you want and the type of activities that could thrive in your country. So uh, uh, Panama has been uh, very keen in, in understanding what those needs are by having a very open dialogue with the private sector and with, uh, with the foreign investors. Uh, we are very aware that we need to uh, have a self-sustaining um, uh, educational alternative to supply these companies with the right kind of talent. And I'm, I'm really glad uh, um, Dr. Kenneth mentioned the, the Celtic Tiger, and you're, you're Irish. Correct? Henry? No. You're no. not? No, we have an office <laughs> oh, Wait, wait like, it's Irish, isn't it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, the, the point is that, that um, I, I Panama is doing something very similar uh, as, as what uh, Ireland did when it had its transformative effect through FDI. Uh, we're essentially, we're copying Singapore's uh, model. Um, you're, we're creating an alternative uh, 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 educational centers that tie academia, try tie the private sector mm -hmm. and government uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of a golden triangle um, so that uh, we're producing the, 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 the right talent in the right fields with the right know-how and with the right experience so that, uh, so that the very, very important <coughs> aspect of, of economic and social development of attracting FDI makes sense uh, in a, in a long-term view. I mean, no, thank you very much for that you know, really detailed explanation of what um, Panama is doing. Um, I mean, there was a few points which stood out to me. I mean, one is that incentives is not just about attracting the initial companies in it, if it's the free zones or other parts of the country, but it's also about um, ensuring competitiveness, whether that's through the supply chain, whether it's through skills, education, Absolutely. training. Um, and I, you also mentioned something like more like the soft incentives. You said, for example, for headquarter operations, you realize immigration's important, so you need to kind of, I don't know, have fast track special policy so they can bring in the talented um, skills into the country. Is that, that's right, so, so incentives, yeah, it's not just financial. Correct. There's soft incentives, and I, I, we can talk a bit later on, but I'm sure that other panelists can talk also about whether those soft incentives are actually becoming as important as the, as the financial incentives, so we'll maybe come on to that. Um, so thank you very much. So um, Minister Jerry Namoff, um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right? Yes, correct. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so like Panama, you know, Macedonia has uh, developed incentives policy around very low or even near zero um, taxes in free zones. And it's one of your key selling messages. I, I, I don't know if I'm right, but I, I just remember reading that Macedonia has the lowest taxes in Europe. It's yes, yeah. true. So I mean, that's one, you know, it stands out. I mean, I remember that, so it's obviously working <laughs> as good. a marketing message. Um, um, but in terms of those low taxes, you know, do they, has that really helped you attract more foreign investment, um, first of all? And another side of Macedonia is that you have a reputation, and in the rankings and so on, you do very well in terms of the ease of doing business for investors. They're very highly ranked in, the, in, in, in those indexes. And I was just wondering, from your experience, you know, what's more important? You know, the, the low taxes in your zones, or the ease of doing business for investors when you're, when you're trying to get companies to, uh, to invest in Macedonia? Um, thank you, good question. I think it uh, depends on the actual customer, the company. In some scenarios, uh, taxes are crucial. In other scen scenarios, it's the quality of the, the workers. Um, so what we have done is we've put an unbeatable package of incentives together based and customized on each uh, investor. Um, we have some natural incentives that everyone gets, just the basic fact that we have the lowest cost in Europe, the lowest taxes. That's for everyone. Um, if you go into the zone, then there's no taxes. Mm -hmm. But if you're outside of the zones, it's a flat 10% and 0% on reinvested profits. Um, so it's a complete package. We have programs that, um, based on uh, the employees you hire and at what age, the government will pay all the social insurance contributions and personal taxes for three, five, and even up to 10 years. And that's a very uh, a valuable uh, incentive. We have, as I mentioned, other incentives that I, I sort of call them natural incentives in the fact that um, we're one of the few countries that put protection for foreign investors in our constitution. And we did that for a reason, so that some crazy future political party can't come into power and easily change um, the uh, excellent uh, laws that we have for them. So foreign investors can own 100% of the company in Macedonia, land, property, and full repa repatriation rights of uh, profits. 
at 100%. Um, it's a natural incentive that we've created uh, one of the best. We have extremely high, highly educated employees. That's because we commit more to G in GDP to education than the United States and the average EU country. So uh, it's, it's a benefit of being a small uh, a country. So um, they take uh, mandatory English from kindergarten through 12th grade and two more years in university, 15 years of English, eight years of a uh, European language. So very good language skills. Uh, and that's important for foreign investors. Um, in addition, we're a small country, but we overcame being small by signing free trade agreements with every country in Europe, regardless if they're in the EU or they're not in the EU, also includes Ukraine and Turkey. So Johnson Controls, for example, is making four different products in four different zones and four different factories, auto components for the German car manufacturers. So that's uh, uh, an excellent uh, reason. And um, we, we have one problem. The problem is not too many people know about Macedonia. And uh, we don't have the money and, uh, to have all these fancy um, uh, uh, campaigns, marketing and uh, PR campaigns. But when they find out that we're the fourth easiest place in the world to open a company, number one in Europe, we're the 10th best place in the world for the ease of doing business. And when our government, our pro-business government came into power in 2006, 10 years ago, we were 94th. Wow. So we improved 84 places. We just got back from a Heritage Foundation, one of the top think tanks in America. We improved 16 places last year to be in the same category as the UAE, United States, UK, and Germany. So um, when people come to Macedonia, I always tell them we're the most competitive pro-business country in Europe. They don't believe me until they check and talk to the companies and visit. One other thing, there's five of us ministers uh, coming from the diaspora of the United States, excuse me, six. And we all come from business experience, not politics. So we have an economic team that all was very experienced and very successful in the United States, who our prime minister asked to come back and help Macedonia attract jobs because we needed them severely. Our unemployment in 2006 was almost 40%. Wow. It's 23% today. That's unheard of. Well, I mean, uh, it, it really does sound like a paradise for foreign investors, so uh, <laughs> it's, it really sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> I put a business paradise on my presentation because <laughs> an investor from Milan, Italy, yeah. once he invested, he used that word paradiso, mm -hmm. that he, he couldn't believe what I was saying. He ended up <laughs> invested $30 million so, in Macedonia. I mean, I have one, just one question, because uh, we can move on. I mean, yeah. uh, so what's the real contribution of foreign investment? How, d how does the country make money out of it? Because you're not giving, there's almost no taxes, it's such an easy place to do business. I, I know job creation was clearly one of the key priorities. Yes. But I mean, what, what are the other contributions do you think the foreign investors are making, given they're probably paying not too much tax? Well, I, with the contributions the foreign investors are making, yeah. I think that it is, it is forced our local domestic companies to be more competitive and learn how to really do business because Breaking away from Yugoslavia 25 years ago from a socialistic system, frankly, we had no concept of how to do business. Yeah. And, and this has really been how we've rebuilt our economy because we had to learn from the best. They have to learn from Johnson Controls, Johnson Matthey, and these top, uh, top companies in the world. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's really interesting. It, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, m moving now towards the, uh, the um, country we're in now um, and, and looking at Abu Dhabi. I mean, Dr. Adib Al-Afifi, um, Abu Dhabi has been one of the, the world's economic su success stories. I think uh, Abu Dhabi has amongst the number two or three highest per capita income in the world. So it's obviously been you know, incredibly successful. Um, but in terms of that success, I mean, how much of that has been driven by free zones and the related incentives? I mean, how, how, how influential has that been? And I mean, what are the policies incentives or other policies Abu Dhabi is doing now, you know, to improve competitiveness. And, and just to add a, a final question, uh, a new question, the other, some of the other panelists mentioned some of the models they're looking at, whether that was the Irish experience or Singapore. I mean, given how successful you've been, where do you see as the, what, what's the model you look at, look at? Are there any cities or countries in the world you like and say, yes, we, we can learn from them? That would be quite interesting if you do have any. Very good. Uh, actually, there are th three questions now. Uh, I agree with number one. We're a rich country. We're a rich state, the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. We've got around 10% of oil revenues globally. 
So that's an, not an issue with us regarding promoting Abu Dhabi uh, in the right sense. Uh, regarding your first question, free zones. Uh, what are we doing? What are we applying today? Uh, what, what kind of incentives? What is the role of free zones today? Uh, the opening speech by His Excellency, the Minister of Economy, just yesterday, noted that 30% of non-oil GDP of Abu Dhabi or the UAE contributes from free zones. This shows you clearly free zones are a backbone to the UAE today. They have played a major role in economic development and growth in general in, 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 in the UAE and specifically uh, in Abu Dhabi. Since we started uh, around 10 years ago with the fluctuation of oil prices, oil is our backbone. We've got most of our revenue started from oil uh, 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 sales and so on. So we started 10 years ago thinking of non-oil sectors, free zones, non-oil projects, uh, and incentivizing them. So starting with the number of free zones, there are around seven now in the Merit of Abu Dhabi, we had three uh, requests, very simple requests, for you as an investor to come and s establish your business in a free zone. Uh, it should be, uh, uh, firstly, capital intensive. It should be knowledge transfer with know-how, technology-led, and highly added value products and services. That's very broad and simple. Otherwise, we'll be more than happy to shake your hands and say, come please and start your business with different incentives uh, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Luckily, that I'm sure you already know, there's no, nothing called income tax, corporate tax. More or less, we, you're really in a, I, I'm not going to say what you just noted, but uh, uh, free, really free uh, uh, tax environment. Uh, uh, answering your uh, 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 second question regarding what kind of incentives do you provide today to uh, FDIs or uh, uh, what do you, how to, can you really encourage FDIs to come and to start in, in Abu Dhabi in general? Uh, what kind of policies? We've literally on the ground on a weekly basis, we think out of the box. Today it's a very competitive market. Let's, let's, be, let's agree on this. We've got more than 150 IPAs all over the world sharing the same cake, more or less. So it's sometimes a cutthroat, if it is the right word or not, to get right, the right investments, 500 big companies to come invest in your country or on your emirate. Uh, saying this, we always amend ourselves. We always do not apply our request. It's the other way around. Without the companies, what do you want? What is your wish list? Tell us. How do you, what would make you come? And then we amend ourselves. We amend our policies to make sure it aligns with what the big players uh, would make them come and to stay in, in, in Abu Dhabi. Ironically, very important to know, is basically 70% of FDI's growth are through reinvestments, meaning companies or, or IPAs always focus on uh, 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 bringing FDIs to the country and forget that most of these FDIs that have, have been already established in the country, 70% grow and grow in, in, in their same place and area. So more focus in that area uh, on current uh, investment is, is very, very important. Your last question was basically... Uh, are uh, there any other countries or cities in the world you look to and maybe there's, okay. uh, you see as a best practice perhaps which you can look at? As I, I noted from the beginning, we've got, we've got two eyes, one eye is looking internally, domestically, another eye globally, meaning what are our competitors doing? What kind of new incentives? How can we be always in the run and make sure that we don't uh, 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 get delayed uh, from the big picture? So we've basically, through our strategy, we've looked at four countries, Singapore, Ireland, uh, New, Ze New Zealand, basically why these countries, they've got, they started uh, uh, same as us, mostly agriculture, four countries, and then developed to be uh, uh, more uh, knowledge-based economies. So uh, these are the countries we always benchmark. No, I mean, thank you very much. I think that was really, really interesting um, in terms of uh, the policies, the role of zones in the economic development and you know, how you see the future and also uh, how you see the competition 
and that you have to continuously reevaluate your policies, look at what you're doing domestically, what, what your competitors or best practice countries are doing, and, and, and learn from that. So I think that's, that's, that's really, really, really interesting. Um, but moving on maybe to a, to a bigger economy, if you don't mind me saying, we've just looked at primarily rather small but extremely open and successful economies of the world. I mean, looking at um, in Indonesia, um, Dr. Himawan Harioga, I mean, uh, Indonesia, of course, is one of the world's most important and fastest growing emerging markets, one of the biggest populations uh, in the world. You have a huge and growing domestic market, huge labor force, low costs, huge natural resources. I mean, do you need incentives? Shouldn't investors just go to Indonesia anyway? <laughs> That's my first question. I understand these very small, open trading economies. They're competing for mobile investments, headquarters, technology, software, manufacturing. And they're, they really are competing with, with locations in their region globally. But you know, Indonesia has so many advantages. Does it need to give incentives is the first question. Um, and you, know, you, you are, of course, competing within the ASEAN market. There, there's huge 600 million person you know, uh, a free trade, free trade area, and you're competing against some very advanced economies. Singapore, the, I think the other panelists all mentioned Singapore as, the, as, a, as a model, as an economic development success model for the world, and you're competing against them, I guess, for certain projects, they're there, or they're there in your region. Um, and, and I mean, what policies, whether incentives or other policies, are, is Indonesia developing to help you know, compete with, with, with other locations? Um, so that's, that's the, the two questions I have. For now, thanks. <laughs> yes, thank you, Henry. Yes, uh, we have learned from our discussion with investors and also from the result of a number of surveys that investment incentive, uh, in particular fiscal incentive, is not even in the list of the five most important reasons or motives uh, for investing in Indonesia. Uh, it seems that foreign investors, more particularly, are more attracted to the fundamentals of the economy, you know, in particular, the large size of the domestic market, the steady economic growth, the still competitive labor costs, and um, natural resources. But We still provide incentive um, more to attract investment in selected industries or sectors uh, considered as priority sectors to the economy and, and or to selected regions to support some government uh, program. For example, infrastructure development the uh, industrialization, especially to build the basic uh, industry, pioneering industry like basic metals, basic chemicals, uh, petrochemical industry, etc. The promotion of the uh, processing of the natural resources to add value to our abundant natural resources and also to promote the regional development to help address the geographically unequal distribution of investment. And since uh, we know that investors are more concerned about ease of doing business in Indonesia rather than incentive, we usually uh, combine this incentive with other policy instruments or measures, like the negative list of investments that has been uh, recently liberalized to make more businesses are open to foreign uh, investors, for example, and to provide ease of uh, licensing through our one-stop integrated uh, licensing services at our office at the national level as well as the local levels. Um, we provide three-hour investment services, for example, for some eligible industries. Um, we develop special economic zones, bonded zones, and we also provide uh, investment protection. Those are basically uh, policy instruments to complement the uh, fiscal incentive. Uh, for Indonesia, um, which uh, budget or fiscal is very much constrained right now, uh, we provide 
fiscal incentive uh, only uh, to selected industries. Mm -hmm. And we believe that uh, what we do in improving the ease of doing business is more important to investors to make Indonesia more attractive to uh, investment. Just for your information that we have just improved our if ease of doing business ranking uh, by 15 uh, levels from 106 to 91. Mm -hmm. But you know what? The President Jokowi, who is former businessman, he is totally unsatisfied with the result and keep asking the whole cabinet ministers, you know, to work harder and harder to make our country in the top 40 position in the new uh, two years to t by 2019. Uh, with regard to your second question, by the way, Singapore is uh, number one of the largest investors in Indonesia, but everybody knows that uh, basically, uh, investment coming from Singapore is partly Indonesian money coming back to Indonesia or uh, uh, UAE investors uh, investing in Indonesia using Singapore at the third country and some others, you know. But uh, what I'm going to say is uh, intra-ASEAN uh, investment is also uh, doing uh, well right now. For example, Malaysia is among the top 10 investors in our country. Mm -hmm. And we also invest in Vietnam, yeah. for your information. Mm -hmm. And we think that uh, so far, the use of incentive in promoting the nation competitiveness is uh, still on the track, right on the track right now. Uh, we use this incentive to promote infrastructure development uh, for electricity development, uh, um, including renewable energy, uh, transportation, logistic uh, development. This is very important for us to uh, reduce the logistic and transportation cost, which is now considered uh, still too high. We need to lower down this uh, logistic and uh, infrastructure or uh, transportation costs in order for us to be more uh, competitive uh, as an economy, for example. You know. We also develop the digital economy, uh, like uh, e-commerce, uh, which is uh, now doing very well. Uh, now the digital economy uh, accounted for 7% of our total G GDP, you know, with a steady rate of growth. You know. So these are all, uh, I think, uh, is uh, very much in line with the objective of providing in, in incentive uh, in combination with other policy instruments, you know, to improve our competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, to, really interesting to hear from, you know, uh, a, a major emerging market as well. So, I mean, just uh, what I take out of your, your, your comments is that you're using incentives strategically to attract and promote certain industries which will contribute to uh, uh, the economic development to support competitiveness, especially infrastructure, which then benefits all companies. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as like the other panelists as well, to improve the business environment. We see that as an incentive or, or, or yeah. a, a reason for companies to invest, even maybe more important than incentives. So that, w that was uh, you know, really, really good to hear. I, I also, I mean, in terms of my comment about you know, Singapore and the competition, you seem to basically say that actually it's an opportunity. That, uh, you know, the, ASEAN is an opportunity for everyone, yeah. and it's like a win-win. Yeah. You, know, you invest, yeah. other countries, they invest in you, so actually the competition is good, mm. and you know, it benefits everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah, is, that, is that right? Yeah, yeah is that right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. So um, um, f finally, um, uh, Mr. Hamid uh, Mamadou, um, it'd be really you know, great to get the, the view of uh, you know, the World Trade Organization and yourself personally. Um, in terms of all the discussions so far, so to save me summarizing it, maybe, <laughs> maybe you can give your comments. Um, and, you know, to give your view in terms of the role of incentives, do they make a difference? Are governments giving too much incentives away? Um, and you know, from the trade point of view, um, are incentives distorting trade? You know, are these governments in breach of WTA organizations? And uh, you're gonna have some serious conversations afterwards. It would be good just to hear you know, uh, the, the WTA perspective on all this, thanks. Thank you, Henry, thank you. Uh, 
no, of course, uh, as you rightly said, I've come to this subject from a slightly different perspective. <clears throat> now, of course, it, it is recognized that incentives have their policy uh, justification for uh, sectoral or uh, or regional development considerations. Uh, all that is 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 uh, our points well taken. Uh, our starting point, and you know, the WTO is a treaty system that sets rules for trade. Uh, but of course, trade for us also includes trade in services, which is you know what I explained earlier today. And trade in services covers two thirds of global FDI. Uh, and the rules there are basically uh, promoting competition and non-discrimination. So our concern with incentives perhaps might come from the potential of trade distortion side, and I'll come to that in a minute. But our starting point also is that um, incentives of any kind are no substitute for good policy. So you, your starting point basically is that you start from a sound policy that creates the right competitive conditions, and um, sometimes the best incentive is to remove obstacles. Uh, that in itself might go a long way in promoting FDI flows. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into the policy desirability of uh, locational and behavioral um, incentives as classified by the World Bank or um, the cost and benefit analysis of sustainability of some incentives versus others. But the, the important point here to bring out is that um, incentives are uh, so often specific to enterprises or groups of enterprises, and they draw distinctions. Once you start drawing distinctions, then you run the risk of modifying conditions of competition. And that is where the WTO concerns really come in. Uh, and the instruments usually used are either tax instruments uh, or financial in incentives, per se, or sometimes um, other incentives in kind, like um, uh, conditions for land lease or, or, or land ownership. Uh, <clears throat> and then um, you look at it from, I'll look at it from um, both perspectives. In terms of merchandise trade, actually, the, the, the rules in the WTO do not um, interfere with investment regimes at all. However, um, if incentives end up providing um, a form of subsidy to an industry that exports, and I think <clears throat> most of us are familiar with the uh, famous Boeing and Airbus cases, you will end up actually, if a, if a, if a causal relationship is established between uh, an incentive and an export, uh, and there is a determination that there is a subsidy uh, or a distortion of any kind, then you might run into problems, and we have seen several problems in that respect. So this is one thing to be taken into account. From the uh, services side where the, the interface is much wider, the question here becomes um, how do you ensure that incentives do not distinguish between service suppliers in ways that modify conditions of competition that might run foul or of the most favored nation obligation, which is not to distinguish between service suppliers of any member of the WTO. And we've seen situations like that in big industries like distribution and the banana case and um, uh, in, in it is also, also possible to see examples like that in many industries, be it um, uh, uh, particularly the case of distribution is, is important, but also industries like uh, telecommunications, uh, express delivery, um, logistics, uh, uh, and the list goes on and on. Uh, here the question is um, basically the, the selective removal of restrictions might become the incentive whereby um, exceptionally, for example, for certain service suppliers or certain companies, you would allow 100% foreign ownership, while actually your rule is not to allow more than 49. So there, you, you, the, the government is not handing out an incentive, but actually it is a bit tricky because you are distinguishing in the treatment of service suppliers in a way that would 
modify conditions of competition and create, create distortions. Now, <clears throat> this is very roughly from the rules point of view, and these are things that I think countries who are members of the WTO would need to be mindful of. From a policy perspective, I think, uh, from a services side, we've always been uh, mindful of how services openness and uh, competitive conditions in services markets really, really uh, uh, represent a huge advantage for economies to advance, particularly developing economies. The opening of services markets uh, is much more important to achieve development than the opening of manufacturing markets. Now, of course, you will, you will say that oh, they're intertwined now and the servicification of manufacturing is a new phenomenon and all this, but it remains a fact that in order to develop your services sector, you would need to open up to foreign investments, to foreign technology, foreign know-how, and this cross-pollination between foreign and domestic elements is really what makes your services sectors pick up. The perfect example that we have seen over the past 20 years is the telecommunications sector. Look around the world, there is no country, there is no developing country or, or, or any other country that could have developed its telecommunications sector to where it is today without actually opening up and making it a competitive sector as opposed to the old uh, monopoly. So um, I, I know I'm striking a slightly different tone, but I would say, fine, we respect incentives, but we take it with a pinch of salt and, and you have to be careful how you administer the, uh, okay. the drug. Thank, 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 thank you, you very much. So, I mean, just um, I guess some of the key conclusions from that is uh, your incentives program should avoid distortions um, in the economy. Absolutely. Um, be careful of WTO rules <laughs> in terms of supporting certain companies or groups of companies versus others, or foreign versus domestic as well, or other way around. Um, I mean, the, just very quickly, because I think we, in a few minutes we have to wrap up. Like the Boeing example you said. Um, wouldn't the counter argument be that, well, in the US or Airbus or in Europe, you have such high corporate taxes, they don't have these fantastic business zones and environments like the other countries have where there's very little tax to pay in these zones or these special areas. They don't have that so much, you know, in Europe, um, in the EU or in the US. So the companies have very high tax rates. So those cash incentives and other grants and that they get is, is a compensation for having to pay so much tax. What, what would be the re response to that? I think, I think the response to that is that you're basing a measure on your own policy choice, which is, <laughs> this is why I was saying in the beginning, you know, <clears throat> an incentive is no replacement for a good policy. So you might want to go back to the first policy choice and see whether that was optimal or it needs adjustment. Which it seems that the countries here have done already <laughs> and looked at what is the optimal policy. So, I mean, we have over just a few minutes left. So maybe, first of all, if, I mean, if you, are, if you do have a comment very quick, please. Any panelists have any observations on any of the other comments? And then maybe w one, yeah, that, that's fine to do. I'm just checking our timing. And then and maybe we can ask the audience if they have one or two questions as well. So first, first of all, D Douglas, do you have a, a comment? Yeah, a few quick comments. I think, um, you know, we need to be fair so for some of the uh, developing and emerging markets here. I think uh, the developed markets um, of today, uh, develop, developed economies, were no, not able to develop themselves or industrialize themselves without the incentive packages that they gave in the past. So I think, you know, for many countries here, I think the question from the lady from Senegal asked in the previous session, how can we really attract investment? And I think Singapore itself was a very good example. If Singapore would not have offered any incentives back in the 1960s, it would not, not have been able to develop. So I think we need to be a little fair to sort of disregard all the locational incentives that are provided to lure or to, or to attract more investment to, to specific economies. Uh, the developed markets, we have done something similar in the past. So they're basically copying us. So the second brief point I would like to make, the transition from locational incentives towards sort of more behavioral incentives is something that most um, policymakers are looking for. How can you actually influence the specific behavior of specific companies that are investing in, in markets? So sort of going beyond the locational incentives and going beyond the financial. I think um, uh, Roberto Alaman mentioned that in Panama is al already the case where you try to influence the behavior of companies instead of just uh, bringing in the companies for investment. I think there's two trends that are really taking place and um, it's also important to manage expectations. What do you really expect from a company? 
to do in your country? Simply job creation or capital expansion and knowledge transfer, and how can that be smartly coordinated if you use some of those behavioral incentives? I, th I think that's very important today. Yeah, thank you, Douglas. I mean, good news is we have more time. So uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, apparently we have another hour, so if we want it. <laughs> I don't know what time it is now, but uh, we can keep going. Um, so um, first of all, any panelists, please, please, if you want to make some further comments, uh, put your hand up and go ahead. Thank you, Professor. OK, yes. Uh, well, I would definitely agree with Douglas that the, uh, the on his point about how you know, developed countries used all a whole plethora of incentives, and uh, it certainly wouldn't be proper to simply say that developing countries can't do that. I mean, the problem is is that keeping developed countries from continuing to do it um, is very difficult to do. I mean, it's been achieved within the European Union to some extent, but if once you go beyond that, I mean, WTO rules aren't well structured to meet investment incentives as opposed to, you know, specific subsidies for, you know, individual goods. Um, so, so, you know, I'd like to see a grad, you know, you would see, you know, incentives would be allowed to be higher in, in developing countries and lower or zero in developed countries, which is approximately what you have in the European Union, but how you would achieve that globally, there's no way to do it at the moment. Um, and also I'd mention a sort, sort of scary thought, if you, perhaps, that a lot of developing countries actually wind up paying more on a cost per job basis for things like automobile assembly plants than you see in developed countries. It's you know, cost about 150000 to $200,000 a job in the United States uh, and in uh, both Brazil, yeah, both Brazil and India, you've seen auto assembly plants cost the government, the state governments there much more than that. Uh, thank you very much. I think the, the minister has a, a comment there as well. Yeah, um, you know, I, I completely agree with the, with the viewpoint that incentives should not be a replacement for good policy, but um, I would even take it a step further. And I would say that uh, incentives should be, should always be a result of good policy, you know, th they will never replace good policy. But but um, essentially, w when when you look at, at at incentives from the perspective of of, of not essentially generating a, a, a factors for your country to 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 beat the competition, but more for your country to become competitive. Uh, and when you look at it from from a from a from a more open market and, and economic integration perspective, then incentives uh, uh, could be an engine for for the right kind of growth in in when a, in in as much as when uh, through that a country can become valuable to its region and its neighbors and, and 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 global trade at large now i know that that might sound a little bit utopian but but um i'm coming from a from a point of view of of a, a that's that's very particular and and that's because it's informed by the um, uh, the the trajectory and, and experience of, of my country, which is Panama. Let me sp go back a little bit. Um, when we came to Dubai uh, in this commercial mission ten, 10 days ago, one of the things that struck me the most, despite the fact that that uh, uh, um, um, Dubai and Panama are, are so distant geographically speaking, uh, uh, economically speaking, we're very similar in the sense that our our economies are oriented to global trade. Uh, we are economic integrators. We are all about um, a, a, a ease of market and, and allowing a, a global value chains to integrate and, and, and uh, thereby making, the, making globalization, uh, uh, fostering the right kind of globalization. <laughs> so with that in mind, um, this isn't really a, a my point is, is is not really a, a, a conclusion of any sort, but but it, it really is an open question, and it is uh, you know if you're looking at incentives from the perspective of good policy, how can you properly design incentives that are not only attractive to firms that will compel the right kind of investment that your country needs to foster its development, but how can you incentivize growth that, that, um, that, that, that 
has a, a positive multiplier effect mm -hmm. in your own region because I, I firmly believe that as, as, as countries integrate economically and, and, and uh, a region becomes wealthier and richer, is, en is, gen is able to generate uh, uh, wealth, that, it, that, it, that is a, 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 a key ingredient for, 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 for peaceful relationships. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I think even the example of Indonesia BKM, you're kind of saying the same with Singapore and how that also uh, supports the region. I mean, do we, was there any more comments? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd like to talk uh, just for a second about uh, macroeconomic policy as, as an incentive, so to speak. I think if you look at a lot of the countries in the world that are in horrible debt, um, they're in trouble. And this panic and this instability, whether it's the United States or not, can cause big problems. We, on the other hand, uh, I think it's, it's the nature of, uh, of our culture um, that we're very adverse to debt. And because of that, we have one of the lowest state and public debt in all of Europe. And that has produced some good things, contrary to what uh, Brussels thinks. It has allowed us to be very attractive for foreign investments and to do some very positive things. Our debt is very low. It's kept our inflation below 2% on average for 15 straight years and to give us 3 and 4% GDP growth compared to Europe, which is, uh, we all know uh, how low that growth is. So I think that's an advantage because the macroeconomic policy is a true indicator of the, of the strength of the country or the stability of a country, reg regardless of what you read in the news. Thank you. Um, any, any more comments from the panelists? And maybe we have a, some final questions from the audience, if you have any. No? Um, any questions? Good, so we have... Um, Maybe I think David first, and then gentleman. Oh, gentleman, he can go first. Yeah, and then pass it to the front. Yeah. Who's first? Yeah, you can go first. All right. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. Very informative panel here. Um, particularly like the um, uh, short but uh, sharp comments and um, statistics that Jerry, Minister for Foreign Investment of Macedonia, shared with us. Thank you very much. It's uh, quite an eye opener. Um, you've got some good uh, metrics there, and um, I particularly liked. Um, Adiva Fifi's comments about keeping an eye domestically and one eye globally. That's very interesting. My question is um, for Dr. Hemawan. Um, I am familiar with his country only because of the phenomenally active role that the embassy and the consulate have played here in the UAE where I've been living for a uh, better part of uh, a decade. and. Um, it, it does seem to be a very, very interesting nation and merited on many perspectives. However, I haven't been there, despite all the active campaigning that his countrymen have done to acquaint me with, um, with his nation. Could he just share uh, the top three sectors, perhaps? Because, you know, Indonesia's um, blessed with many um, endowments and resources. The th top three sectors and sort of return on investment that your average investor could expect there in the current environment? Yes, uh, the top three sectors that, sorry, that's okay. Could you repeat the question, the last part? Yes, the top three sectors and the, if you like, the sort of return on investment your average investor could expect from each of those sectors or segments of industries? Yes, um, uh, an approximate return. <laughs> it's very tough uh, questions. You know, oh, I, I would have thought that would be a sort of simpler, just ballpark figure. Yeah, I'm looking no, at. But is it is it palm oil? Are we talking about a no. sort of seven percent return on investment? <laughs> is it uh, manufacturing okay. components for mobile phones or fisheries and agriculture? The recent development suggests that the new emerging industries like digital economy, e-commerce, including marketplace, for example, is among the fastest growing and most profitable uh, industry right now in Indonesia. The, any kind of the consumer product industry is another uh, sector or industry that provide a sustainable uh, uh, 
relatively high return to the investors. You know, it is for the fact that uh, the um, consumer class in Indonesia, you know, in addition to being large, it is still growing. And the third one that is we think uh, we and we also hope that more and more investment is attracted to is the tourism industry. Uh, for the fact that you know, for a relatively long time, we are very much left behind and we didn't take uh, advantage of our uh, assets, you know, which is uh, the uh, a large uh, and uh, very diverse uh, potential uh, investment destination in Indonesia. And the prospect of the investment in this uh, tourism industry, not only in the very limited uh, traditional uh, activities like uh, hospitality, like hotel and restaurants, but uh, much broader than that, you know, it also includes the theme park, you know, attraction as well as the uh, supporting infrastructure like uh, waste management and water uh, supply and water management, the uh, energy supply within the uh, tourism uh, destination itself. You know. So if I may fit then the uh, digital economy, including e-commerce, the second one, the uh, consumer uh, product economy, mm -hmm. any kind, and the third one is tourism mm -hmm. industry. It's different from uh, five to ten years ago, you know, when natural resources and you know, with the booming or uh, high commodity price, you know, were still there, you know. We hope that, you know, Indonesia now has a different face, you know, uh, with the increase of the uh, consumer class and a more uh, literate, uh, young uh, and dynamic uh, population that we have. Thank you. Um, I mean, we're actually working with uh, about 20 Canadian companies, helping them invest in Indonesia. So happy to have a chat about you know, their their experience and the kind of sectors they see as offering best return on investment. <laughs> um, David, you have a, a question as well. Thank you, Henry. Um, a really fascinating panel. What I would like to quickly raise touches upon something that was discussed earlier this afternoon, which is to do with automation and robotics. Mm. What impact, I mean, again, it, it, it's really quite a quick question. What impact do you think? If companies start going down this route, which we've heard from one of the speakers was saying it's going to happen, get used to it, it's happening right now. How should that change or how, how do you think it will change how incentives are offered to companies? Because obviously, you know, incentives are strategic in terms of what you're supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be helping create jobs and, and so on and so forth. So how, how do you, as the, the panelists, see this? I mean, how is that going to impact the, the incentives landscape? Thanks. So, I mean, I guess the question is robotics, automation. How does that affect your incentives policy? And any comments on that from any of the panelists? Yeah, David, just to, to comment on that, I think the whole discussion about these new industries like robotics, artificial intelligence. There's an interesting book by an Italian professor, Mariana Masukatu, and she actually emphasized that the state is the biggest financer of these emerging industries. So in fact, they've already been subsidized. Um, so in terms of you, in, if you want to attract those types of investment, I think that's a different story. But the, these, these industries also, um, like Apple and Google, they've been heavily subsidized by the US government in terms of their government and innovation policies in the past. And that's, that's her argument. And I think that's a very valid argument as well. So you'll probably see many emerging markets also trying to subsidize those industries in different ways, which actually creates a new landscape for behavioral incentives that are going to be developed in terms of these emerging industries. That's a, a great comment, Douglas. I mean, I was actually reading just a few days ago that in Canada, they've um, just announced a $180 million fund for artificial intelligence. So yeah, I mean, government does have a, you know, a key role in supporting, you know, and trying to get ahead of the competition as well. I mean, there's a competition to be the leader. You don't want to be left behind. You know, if, if artificial intelligence, robotics is the future, 
you know, as a, as, a, as a government, I'm sure Abu Dhabi already has an eye on that. <laughs> um, looking, at, looking all around the world at what's happening. I mean, you need to be, you know, look, looking at the future and, and uh, you know, ensuring your policies, you know, are going to, to enable your country or your city to, or region to compete in those industries. Yeah. And I think a question over here. Voilà, je vous remercie. Euh, moi, je vais parler français. Je viens du Sénégal. C'est Maktar Gagne, euh, du ministère de l'économie, des finances et du plan du Sénégal. Euh, saluer la qualité du panel. Hein. Je pense que pour le, les informations pertinentes qui nous ont été fournies euh, cet après-midi euh, et euh, la qualité des informations données. Euh, euh, dire simplement, euh, par rapport à M. Douglas, euh, que... Au Sénégal, il y a bien des incitations fiscales et qu'une étude récente nous a permis de chiffrer ces incitations fiscales à à peu près 10% du budget de l'État pour le dernier exercice, soit 100 milliards de francs CFA. Euh, saluer également ce qu'a dit M. Imamam qui euh, nous fait comprendre que euh, la fiscalité n'est pas en fait la, euh, le premier déterminant de l'investissement. Il est au-delà des, des cinq premiers déterminants. Ça aussi, c'est important. Et cela nous permet peut-être d'embrayer sur un point de vue. C'est qu'il faut aller vers des équilibres, notamment pour les États comme les nôtres, qui ont tout à bâtir. Il s'agit en fait de bâtir les États-nations, de mettre en place des infrastructures, un système éducatif, tout ce que vous avez eu à dire pour attirer l'investissement. Aussi, nous nous insistons au Sénégal sur un droit commun fiscal incitatif, plus que sur des dispositions euh, fiscales euh, euh, particulières. Euh, nous insistons également sur le fait de bâtir une administration de services, rendre les services euh, de qualité et agir sur le coût des facteurs euh, et sur la qualité. Ça, c'est peut-être les observations que j'avais à dire. Euh, peut-être terminer par une question. Euh, comment éviter la compétition fiscale dommageable puisque tous les États cherchent à attirer des, euh, des idées. Je vous remercie. Thank you uh, uh, for the, for that comment. It, in fact, it was uh, an elaboration as far as I could follow. My my French is not excellent, but I could follow that you were elaborating on the uh, business environment and the competitiveness of the business environment of of Senegal. And the reason I took Senegal as an example because it was in the previous panel there was a question from from a lady asking how can Senegal actually, what is the advice you can actually give Senegal to attract more investment? And I was using it as an example to say like countries like Senegal or other countries in Western Africa or other countries in Asia uh, that are at different stages of economic development may have to use a very competitive business environment but obviously cannot really um, uh, benefit from having a huge reservoir of potential investors, specifically also in some target or priority <coughs> industries, they would have to actually, and I think the example was shown here also in terms of Indonesia, they may have to provide incentives for some of the industries in which they want to attract more investment and where they do not really have testimonials or existing investors. So it's trying to show the example of we should not really develop one global incentive policy framework for all countries. I think. Countries at different stages of economic development, wherever they are, require different incentive policies. Whether that's good or right, I think I leave that to the international organizations to evaluate. But I think that that's one of the things that we see that companies are looking for. So we need to be fair that, you know, we can't really say this is a general framework for incentives. It, it depends on the, the, the level of economic development and what the country would like to achieve. If we'd like to attract more investments in some industries that it doesn't have that experience yet. So that, that was the, the background actually to my question, but I understand you have an excellent and a very competitive business environment already. So thank you. Th thank you, Douglas. Thank you for the question. Is there one, one final question? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Fatima. I am the president of African Business Woman. I come from Senegal. My question to Abu Dhabi. You tell us that uh, at Free Zone, we don't t pay tax. I would like to create a company in Dubai or Abu Dhabi to produce mango juice about mango from Senegal. And somebody tell me that I need sponsors 
and the sponsor uh, ask many money to have <laughs> a company. How can I do to create a company in Dubai or Abu Dhabi? Uh, Panama, a question to Panama. Panama has a paradise, terrace paradise. You have uh, now a lot of uh, enterprise, a lot of money. Uh, wha how do you invest in Africa? Because many African has sent his money to Panama. I, I know Senegalese who have money in Panama Bank and uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Ms. Fatima. Ms. Fatima, uh, I, me personally, will, will uh, after finishing this panel, will, will talk to you one to one and guide you. You've got the mics on now. Very good. M me personally, after finishing this panel, will guide you one to one and show you what are uh, what is needed from you to start your business in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. Uh, correction to what you just noted: in free zones, you do not need sponsor. You have 100% foreign ownership, no taxes. Not at all. Uh, I think you are misinformed. If you do not do your business in free zones, yes, you would need a partner, uh, sponsor, or whatever you see best. But in free zones, no, you do not need uh, a, a sponsor or even an, 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 a partner. And I'll be more than happy, uh, as I said, to talk to you one-to-one uh, -one on, the, on your project. And if you want to enter into Europe, I will help you enter into Europe. <laughs> so you can hit both great marketplaces. And, and, and uh, uh, from the perspective of Panama, if I understood your, your, your question correctly, it's, it's always a matter of, of um, a, a tying, tying demand to what is being offered in, in a particular country. Now, Panama's particular offer is, is uh, we're essentially a, a, a logistics and distribution hub not just for goods, but for services. Um, in, in fact, we're, we're quite unique in, 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 in our region for, for that dynamic. So I would invite you to engage in a conversation with, with um, Proimbex Panama, which is the National Investment Promotion Agency, so that we can uh, figure that out from both perspectives, from, from services as well as, as, as redistribution of goods. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you very much. Um, any final comments any of the panelists would like to make before we uh, close the panel? Everyone's ready for dinner. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for staying this late in the evening. Thank you so much for our panelists. I think we should definitely give them a, a good round of applause. Thank you very much.